Okay. So I hope you had a good spring break and very productive, and I hope you enjoyed a lot of uh, project work. Uh, maybe at the beach. Well, I see so many tired people here, so I think you've actually all been working very hard. Um, in any case, so. Today we're going to do graphical models. So for those of you who've done the graphical models class with uh, Mike and Martin, this should actually be a very, very, very basic refresher. For those of you who haven't done them, I hope it'll help you to some extent get up, getting up to speed. I mean, uh, do look through that and also through some of the supplementary material that I have on uh, yeah, basically the website for the class. Um, so we're going to do mainly directed graphical models today. We'll talk a little bit about dependence, fully observed models, incomplete information. Um, I'll do some things on the um, whiteboard. The undirected graphical models will pretty much do a lot of that. In the next class, we'll do dynamic programming and a few inference techniques. So maybe we're not going to get to dual decompositions, but at least the M extensions will happen. Um, so next week I'll be around. The week thereafter I'm not here and Marty Sinkovich is going to talk about explore exploit algorithms <coughs> in two weeks time from now. He's a fantastic guy. He's built a lot of things in Yahoo. Uh, I hope he'll still be with Yahoo in two weeks time at the moment in tough places. <laughs> Volatile. So. Uh, I might very well have received an email about being laid off right now. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, that shouldn't really matter. I mean, the, the class will go on, so don't worry. Uh, I'm not going to disappear, nor is Marty. Um, but, okay, so I'm, because I'm going to be at World of Web in two weeks, so that's why um, Marty will fill in for me. And then after that, there'll be one more week. We'll be mainly doing applications of graphical models. Uh, large scale to mainly problems on the internet. After that, there are then two weeks for the presentations. I'd very much appreciate if you could sign up for the first presentation block as opposed to the second one, um, because I've got a visitor from Germany from the MPI giving and coming over. And if possible, I'd like to be able to spend time with him doing math. So, uh, and he might actually come over here and give a talk as well. So those of you who've done their yeah, presentations can then go and attend his talk as opposed to listen to the other presentations or whatever. So I, I think it might be a, you might be in for quite a treat if we can make that happen. Okay, so please sign up for the for May one for your presentation if you can, and send an email to Dalpo and just say I want to present May one, and he'll make a schedule. First come, first serve. Okay, directed graphical models, let's look at the basics first. Um, so, who of you hasn't heard of directed graphical models yet? Uh, okay, so this should be very trivial for you then. Um, I'll just start with the simple things to cover some common ground. So let's say I have, you know, two systems that actually drive my website. So I have like a database and I have a web server and you know, my website is up and running if those two things work. In that case, well, I can simply have, you know, the joint distribution of N, A, and W, so MySQL, Apache, and the website, being something where the website depends on, you know, how my two services are doing, and then, you know, depending on how these are doing. And I'm at the moment assuming that they're actually, you know, operating independently of each other, which, of course, is true, but um, an interesting thing, of course, is that as soon as I start observing what my website is doing, M and A stop being independent of each other. You can work that out very immediately, just by base rule, and okay, ignoring all the denominator here, you immediately see that it's this function P of W given M and A that now couples M and A. So now they don't factorize anymore. And that's what actually lets us do a lot of inference. So for instance, if I know that my website is working, by immediately just by virtue of that observation, I know that these two things are working. So then, if it's broken, um, oops, 
I know that at least one of those two services is broken. Right. So if I know this is broken and I know this is up and running, I know that this must be broken. Right. I mean, that's how you go and debug the service. You find out, okay, well, your site's down. Well, let's look at one service after the other. If you've verified that your first in minus one services are up and running, you know that it, it ought to be in the last one. If it isn't, you have some serious trouble. Okay, um, so for it's usually you don't quite log that, but maybe what you do is you actually log just the user action. So for instance, if I'm you know running some ads on my site, then I might only find out that my site is down by realizing that all of a sudden Google isn't paying me any money for the ads anymore. <laughs> so that can happen if I don't have very good instrumentation up here. Um, of course, why would you actually care about doing this? Well, one thing is simply that, you know, having 15 parameters for the full joint is kind of painful. Here, one, two, three, four, right? So basically, that's why I get 15 parameters because 2 to the 4 is 16, minus 1 because everything needs to sum up to 1. So that's how we get 15. In this case, we get 1 plus 1 plus 4 plus 1. Why do we get that? Well, one parameter for this, one parameter for this, to just model whether it's up or down, up or down. In this case, I need to condition on, well, four different states that this could have, right? So that's why I need four parameters. And then, depending on whether the site is up, I need only basically one more parameter to model the user. The other nice thing that it does, it gives me causal relations because I can now you know, ask questions like, well, what's going to happen if I switch this off? Well, then everything breaks here. Um, this is an interesting distinction. So, for instance, I know that if I, you know, manipulate this light switch here, so like right ramp, right? So depending on how I manipulate this, I know that, you know, the light will go on or off. So, therefore, there's a clear causal relationship between light switch and lamp. Right? However, if I don't know that and just observe correlation, I could equally argue by you know unscrewing or screwing in the light bulb here, this lever is going to move, right? Which is complete nonsense. And so, if I only observe correlation, I cannot actually distinguish between does the light bulb cause the lever to move, or does the lever moving the lever here, the dimmer, cause the light bulb to go on or off? And there are some very nice works. So Julia Pearl has done a lot of work on trying to, you know, infer causal directions and some measures of dependence can let you come to reasonably good guesses about which way dependencies go. There are things like directed, directed information, which is a variant of neutral information that lets you also estimate those things. So there are a lot of tools that can be used to try and guesstimate which way those arrows go. We're not going to get into this game and we're just going to pretend and actually have some knowledge of which way those symbols behave. In some cases, you can actually reverse the arrows and get equivalent probability distributions out of it. In most cases, you can't. So, if in doubt, don't try reversing the arrows in anger because you're going to get a different model. Okay, so the obvious thing is you can't really have loops in there. So, let's say we have the chicken and the egg. Okay, actually, it's sort of biological anomaly because roosters don't really lay eggs, but it looks prettier, right? Um, so, the rooster lays an egg and, well, maybe hatches from an egg. Well, that part at least is, makes sense, but yeah, okay, sh sure, you still need a rooster to have a fertile egg. Fine. Anyway, um, so if we try modeling chicken and egg in this way, right? Uh, P of chicken given egg, P of egg given chicken then I end up with garbage. I mean, that's not really a valid joint probability distribution. And, of course, the valid thing would be to have either P of chicken given egg times P of egg, or P of egg given chicken times P of chicken. So in other words, this is clearly a really, really bad idea. So don't ever try modeling things this way. And I just really have to repeat it many times because I've seen it too many times actually occur in the company where people said, hey, I've modeled it, and gee whiz, it works, so it can't be wrong, right? And it is just horribly wrong. And, okay, so please never do this in real life later on. 
So the obvious question is, you know, what went wrong? Because I mean, obviously, you know, depending on whether I have an egg, I get the chicken, or depending on whether I have the, the chicken, I get the egg. Well, what we completely ignored is the time dependence, because it's not the egg from which the chicken hatches that is the egg that the chicken lays. It's the, it's the n plus first egg, right? And so as soon as you turn this cycle into a spiral and basically, you know, unroll it, it's just like, you know, loop unrolling, so to say, at that point, you again can establish causality and everything is fine. So whenever you get those loopy dependencies, it pretty much means that you haven't done a good job with modeling. At least if you want to have causal relationships and you get those cyclical behaviors, some, something is wrong in your model. I mean, you might have the situation where, you know, you want to go to, you know, let's say a baseball game and your girlfriend wants to go and see a movie and um, then, you know, of course she'd rather come with you than, you know, go alone to the movie and you'd rather come with her rather than going alone to the baseball game. So you might actually have situations that seem to be cyclical, but at the end of the day, in that case, maybe a directed graphical model is not a good way for modeling it unless maybe, you know, she's calling the shots and you'll do whatever she does anyway, in which case, <laughs> that's a good model. Um, so, choose wisely which model you pick. Uh, statistical model, that is. Um, good. So, direct the graphical models. Um, here's more formally what we get. So we have P of X, given, it is basically the product of P of XI, given its parents, and this works as long as I have a directed acyclic graph. So I can have a graph like this beast here, and if you squint at it, you'll see, well, you can't really form a loop. That's all you need. So this, as soon as you can form a loop, that's not a valid thing. But in that case, everything is fine. Now, why is this actually a nice object? Well, because if x is really fully observed, then the likelihood can be decomposed. And, well, you can see that easily. Well, you know, here we have P of xi given the parents. All those guys are observed. I parameterize them, you know, give them some parameter theta here. And I take the log, and now this becomes a very beautiful sum. And then if I want to maximize, you know, this with respect to some parameter theta, maybe have some prior, maybe some penalty on theta, these problems become individual subproblems. So going back to you know, the situation here, where you know I have all those space pieces, if I always log triples of the database, the web server, and the website being up, I can model independently, you know, whether the server is up, whether my database is up, and then I can also learn independently whether these things are good. That's good news. Now, if I don't have that, then things get actually really exciting, and this is where you can then do a lot of exciting research and write a lot of papers and whatever. So, whenever you don't really observe all the things, but only observe parts of it, you need to build an algorithm which is able to estimate well, what the, let's say, for instance, we don't observe this line, we observe everything else, and you need to have an algorithm which is able to estimate what this value would have been in the presence of everything else in further parameters. So, as a matter of fact, the M algorithm is going to do that very thing. It's going to come up, let's say we don't observe this guy, with a guess of the distribution of this, given everything else, and then just look at, you know, the expected log likelihood of the entire graph, you know, under the distribution there of, you know, this unknown parameter. And we'll get to that in a little more detail. And EM is one way of going away. You could also simply draw from that distribution. So there are a lot of other techniques that you could use, and we'll get to them throughout this class. Okay. So here's the simplest of all these graphical models. It's called the Markov chain. So the Markov chain basically says, well, you know, consecutively things depend on each other. That sequence, let's say the past, you know, distant past determines the recent past, determines the present, which will determine the future, and so on. So, in a way, 
in that context, uh, you know, the saying of, you know, you should learn, know the, the, the history, otherwise you will repeat the same mistakes, isn't quite true, except if you know the entire <laughs> present state. And if you know all the transition parameters, then you can predict perfectly what the future is going to hold, regardless of what the ever will happen in the past. However, it's not true if you don't have much of a clue of these transition probabilities, then you need to use past observations to learn those transition probabilities to then extrapolate. Right. And that's actually what makes you know, statistical inference nice because that's basically that job. So, and because you know, writing out those chains is rather annoying, here's you know, the for loop equivalent of that. It's called a plate. Who hasn't seen a plate yet? One brave soul. Thanks. So, basically, all it means is just you know repeat whatever is in the plate many many times over. That's all it really means. So, this is still reasonably straightforward, and we can get a very very simple probability distribution. So when we have you know p of x1 through x in, and I can write this as, well, p of x1, well, we have to start somewhere, right, times the product i going from 2 up to n, p of xi given xi minus 1. So that's the mathematical of what's going on here. As a matter of fact, this is kind of sloppy because it doesn't really take much into account what happened to p of x1. But this is more a tool to actually, you know, give you the intuition of what the model is, uh, is about. At the end of the day, yes, you want to actually specify it in this way. But people are just usually very much visual creatures, so this is much easier if you want to explain something. Um, there are some attempts to actually turn this into you know, a proper you know, graphical modeling language. And so systems like Winbugs or Bugs have tried that. There is also the BHC, which is now a little bit defunct, the Bayesian hierarchical compiler of CalDOM, which was a very nice attempt in that direction. And there isn't really a very good system under development right now which does that. Okay, so. Why would I care about market change after I observe everything and you know just move forward? Well, as a matter of fact, if I, for instance, want to do stock prediction and I assume that you know the uh, you know, people in finance are a bunch of creatures with no memory, then you know looking at all past transitions, you could easily infer the present. There are variants of that which you know look back more than one point in time. This is how we would make the things depend on each other. And rather than just what's called the unigram model, you could assume that you have longer range dependencies as well. So on. And you can make it even prettier by going from a bigram to a trigram model. And at some point, these were all the rage in mainly speech processing and speech recognition. So basically, in-gram models. Now, the trouble with those models is not just that they are really a royal pain to draw, but the bigger problem is that they are a royal pain to actually do inference in. And they are a royal pain because now all of a sudden, this variable here will depend on this and that. And that variable. And that means that you'll have to store actually a much larger state. And you'll have the inference problem becomes harder. Let's say, for instance, this variable takes on you know 10 different values. Right. So this one takes 10, 10 values, so each of them takes 10 values. So here I already need to store a 10 by 10 matrix. 
Well, it's still okay, you know, 100 numbers. That's probably also still okay, you know, 1,000 numbers among friends is not much. 10,000. Um, I need a lot of data to do anything meaningful here. So you can see that this actually becomes exponential in the length of the past. And it'll turn out that actually the inference algorithm to infer those states will also be exponential in the past. And that's why generally people stop after maybe y grams. There are interesting models which deal with related stuff to that. They're called semi-Markov models. And you might encounter one of them in your assignments. And there, essentially, what we're going to do is we're going to look at state transitions and lengths of such transitions. I'm not quite sure whether we'll get that in the assignments. I'll have to see whether I can make it simple enough that it's something you can easily solve. This full model might be a little bit painful. Okay, so here's why Markov chains are so super popular, if in, at least in machine learning, it has to do with the hidden Markov models that you can design with that. Basically, the point is, for instance, in speech recognition, so if you use Siri or something like that, they probably use a hidden Markov model for the speech recognition, amongst other things. You have whatever goes into the microphone here, and this is whatever it infers that you've done. Try Siri with anything but an American accent and you're in for a lot of amusement. Uh, at least it doesn't like mine. Uh, you can get interesting things. I mean, there's, with the speech recognizers, um, there's the obvious one, right? Who knows what the speaker meant? So can everybody read it? To break a nice beach. <laughs> okay. Anybody has any idea what the speaker actually wanted to say? To recognize speech. <laughs> to recognize speech. That was what he meant. Um, okay. That's a nice way how you can you know, it sounds very similar, and, well, maybe he pronounced it badly. Uh, another one that uh, is particularly amusing, because a slightly xenophobic Prime Minister of Australia actually fell for that, he hears what the speech recognizer parsed. A straight alien. What he wanted to say is Australia. <laughs> right. And um, yeah, the irony was that it was at the height of the debate about refugees. Um, okay, so these are some very nice failures of how the market models can go wrong. But in general, what you basically try to do is you try to infer what the speaker might have meant given what actually came out of his mouth. You're actually solving such a model right now, I hope, at least if you're paying attention to me, you're trying to infer from what you hear what I might actually have made. And I hope it's not just the words, but actually the math behind it. So, if we want to model this, it's actually not very difficult to modify the current model to deal with it, right? So, let's just Call those things y all of a sudden. Okay, these are the unobserved guys. And then I have, in addition to that, the product i going from 1 to n p of xi given yi. So the x's are now what I'm observing here. They just depend on the corresponding yi's. And the yi's give me that Markov chain. And today we are actually going to look at the algorithm that allows us to do inference in this case. Um, there are a couple of tutorials on that subject, and I think they are more complicated than needs to be to actually understand the algorithm. It's actually very simple. 
again, here's the plate notation. So that's kind of awkward to draw. Um, so here's the unobserved state that really carries the dependency through. Here are the observations. Any questions about the model so far? So here's the math. Just as I promised you, you know, markup chain, well, we start from somewhere, then we keep on going. Here, in this case, it's basically you know, the chain, and then we emit something. And the difference, the whiteboard is that the x and y are Yeah. Okay. That's not the only model you could think of. You could, for instance, have something like factor graphs. Any questions about that model so far? Uh, basically, what I'm doing at the moment is I'm walking you through various templates of graphical models that are reasonably convenient if you want to model large amounts of data. They're not the only ones you can design, you know, customized model, but these are some of, you know, the first tools off the shelf that you might want to use because a lot of people have essentially figured out convenient things for it. Um, so factor graphs are kind of useful, so you basically observe a whole bunch of things. Let's say, for instance, these are the activities of some genes. And you could and you do that for several patients. And you might want to ask the question, you know, now which of the, you know, which are the underlying factors for those? So it could be, you know, that maybe one of them is age, the other one is whether the person is very sick, the other next one might be gender, the next one might be weight, yeah, there they are. And it's not just that, you could also have things like click behavior, queries, watch news, emails. You observe all those things of a user. And you might want to ask, you know, what are the underlying attributes that govern a user's particular activity stream? So latent factors in this case would be things like user profiles, what's actually currently in the news, what you know the keywords are that are currently coming up, you know, maybe his social connectivity and so on, and various things. So that's what factor graphs are used for. We're not going to go into them in a lot of detail in this class, but as with all the tools that I'm going to show you today, it should be easy for you to derive the equations for this. So in case of doubt, basically you rederive things from scratch. It's usually easier than looking up a tutorial which describes things in strange notation. Recommender systems, we already did that last week, so now you're going to see how that all ties together with graphical models. So <coughs> you might have users, movies, ratings, but only for a subset. So that's why you get those interlocking loops. So this is something which, of course, in programming isn't a very nice thing to have, but in stats you can easily write it out. So where do you see that? Well, things like answer, social, ranking, or maybe all personal, whatever recommender systems would be the way to go about. So how do you actually go and design those models? You would you know, have some engineers. So that's really, really, really important that, you know, they tell you how they think that things behave. You should not generally just ignore the engineers. Ignore them if you really feel like they're saying, telling you something very wrong, but at least you should listen to them first. The other thing is in the choice of your models, you might have the computational budget. Just keep to that. So I'm not going to go much into the issue of you know which variables depend on each other. There's this very nice, al nice algorithm called baseball, uh, and that will tell you about it. So just look it up. And, yeah, it's a fairly straightforward algorithm. Um, what we will do is we'll look at inference. So basically, why it's really easy for fully observed situations. We've already seen that. And then, if you don't have fully observed situations, well, how you can use dynamic programming, message passing, sampling, and so on to get something. Any questions at this point? Okay, good. So now we'll do dynamic programming. Before I done that a little bit last time, let's look at things like chains and trees. So here's our model, right? Good chain. And so I might want to ask things like, you know, what is the probability of a sign? Right. So for that, I need to sum over all the x's except the i's one. So now in this case, I can just, you know, go and pull out p of x naught. 
So I'm over this guy separately. And, well, so I have this guy here. Right to the product there. And I can get here the sum of x naught. I have this first factor, and then I have you know, the interaction term between the first and the second factor. And if I sum it out, this gives me a lot. And by the way, we did this already two weeks ago, so it shouldn't be very much news. And now I go and attack, you know, x1. And I sum over it, and I get, you know, the expression that only has x2 involved in this entire term. And so I just keep on making my way through that chain from the left to the right. So if we do this, at some point, We can also do the very same summation from the right hand side. And we will get a message Ri of x. And then I multiply those two. And this will give me the probability in xi. So Basically, what I get, I can just you know, try rolling up this thing from the end. I just take the last term. I get now a, you know, a term that only depends on the second last variable, a third last variable, and I just keep on going through from the end up to the position 9. Any questions about that so far? Who's never done this before? Who has done it before? Okay. The rest is asleep. Mm. Okay. Good. So I hope that will not be difficult. At all. So um, here's the general description. Basically, you know, just take the, the income, take the incoming message, multiply it with a function that depends on these two terms, like this to the backward part, and then here, p of x i. It's just in the product between the forward and the backwards terms. And if I want to get something like, you know, P of everything but Xi, well, I can use phase rule. And if I want to get something of the form, you know, P of Xi, Xi plus 1, well, then I just take the left message, that joint, well, that, that conditional in the right message. Now, here's a question. Suppose I want to do something as follows. Suppose I know that I can, you know, influence history at that point. So I could, you know, so this is, you know, 2012. And this is maybe the year 1980. Maybe that's when we were born. And maybe you could do, so, you could do a time, you, you could be a time traveler and go back and change something there. Right. So then wouldn't it be nice if you could ask, you know, if I change anything there, how is it going to affect the present? I mean, time travel is time traveling aside, questions like that actually come up in bioinformatics quite a bit. Like, if I, you know, do something to my chain here, well, you know, how is my sequence going to, you know, be differently expressed at a later point? So, the question is now, you know, I have, you know, basically something like, you know, 31 years in between, um, how do I actually deal with that entire chain? I don't want to really carry that entire distribution over everything else in between around. I just want to get you know the joint distribution between whatever happened in 1980 and in 2012. Okay. How would you do it? Anybody that have a suggestion? So we've already done parts of that, right? 
Well, so, yes, we can definitely integrate everything out up to here. That's easy. We can also integrate out everything up from the right-hand side, right? That's basically just, you know, doing the standard backwards pass, this is doing our, our standard forwards pass. At this point, things get a little bit messy. <clears throat> so what I have to do now is for any forwards message that I get, so basically any L message, I will now need to put as, you know, basically L1981 of X1981 will now depend parametrically on X1980. So for all possible situations here, I will need to push that message further. Okay, which I can do. Until I have here, you know, this message that, you know, now comes in here and depends on X1980. And that's right, multiplied with the right hand side message and things like that. But I basically need to carry that dependency through. Another way is you simply start integrating out these variables, but you still will end up, you know, pairwise with pairwise dependencies. So it's a little bit more work, but you can still do it. Okay. Here's really what's going on. I basically create messages that go from the left to the right. Mi minus one going to i, and this is some backwards from the right. Now, what happened? Well, all of a sudden, here, this three started branching off, and, well, we have two chains. They all depend on that joint state, x2. Then on the left-hand side, everything moved forward as it was, and all of a sudden, you know, those things branch off. So, you know, you get situations like that, for instance, a Rube Goldberg machine, right, or a domino. Dominoes, right? You line all your dominoes up, at some point it flips over two other dominoes and things move on. So how can we do inference in this case? Up to here on the left, we already know what's happening, right? That's fine. On this chain, we also know what's happening. We've already figured out how you can peel up one guy after the other. So in the end, well, if we keep on peeling off here, keep on peeling off on the left, then what we're left with in the end is something that depends on x2. So we'll have basically one incoming message from the left and two incoming messages from the right. Can we briefly explain what the message means? So the message is basically are those L and R functions that we have. I just renamed them. So basically M I minus one to I was basically this was basically L I of X I. Okay. All I did is I just say, you know, rather than talking about left and right, which is okay in a chain, but really awkward in a graph. In a general graph, I just said, well, the message that goes from the i minus first node, i minus first node, to the i-th node, or in the other case, well, the message that goes from the i plus first node to the i-th node. So it's just such that I don't need to use maybe at some point north, east, west, and whatever, like when you drive on American highways and you never quite know in which direction the road leading west really leads you. Mm -hmm. so it might be any, it might be in an angle of 90 degrees essentially. So um, that's why it's much nicer to just talk about, you know, messages going over an edge from one vertex to another. And this is basically why we want that. So, Let's say, therefore, you know, the message going from 2 to 3. Let's say I want to integrate out all what was here and everything here, and I just want to find out you know, how this affects x. So then what I do is, well, message going from 2 to 3 is 
I take the message coming from 1 to 2. That contains everything that I want to do somehow here. Multiply it with a message going from 6 to 2. And multiply it with, you know, my dependence between x2 and x3. So that would be, in our case, you know, p of x3 given x2. And if I do that, that incorporates all the influence of that chain here on x3. I then still need to take into account how x5 and x4 will behave, but once I've integrated that out, I can figure out what you know, the distribution of x3 would be. Who has seen this kind of stuff before? Cool. It's about two thirds of the audience. So those of you who haven't, I strongly urge you to start asking questions. Because I'm going to assume that you know this thing afterwards, right? If you don't ask questions, I'm going to assume that you know it. And I'm going to assume that you know it in particular for the assignments. So please ask. OK, good. So uh, how would you parallelize it? Well, in this case, I can actually do quite a bit because I can essentially start you know, running these two things. And I could actually run this one here as well. Before I can send the message 2 to 3, I need to actually wait until all the other messages have come in. So more to the point, I can actually, you saw that this guy had to wait until it received the message from 6 before it can now go and produce a message to 3. Then of course it goes on and on and on. So, now, this is all very boring, unless we have this. So now we don't actually observe this chain anymore, but we just observe some observations say, And I need to use this as evidence to infer what actually is going on inside my system. So those states might be actually measurements. So for instance, this could be you know, your computer system. And z, those ZIs are what you get if you take your voltmeter and apply it and, you know, you measure at various locations, you know, what the voltage is. Or maybe you stick your oscilloscope in or whatever. So, what we get through that is a joint distribution over you know, some latent state and observations. So I have, you know, the P of X. It's exactly what we had here. And that tree. And then I have, you know, those P of set I's given the XI. And what I can actually do is I can write this as the program over two different types of functions. So here are the functions that couple the XI's and XJ's whenever they have an edge in the graph where I'm now throwing the, you know, the arrows away. So it's an undirected graph, but basically this is a function that, you know, takes, you know, adjacent pairs as an argument. And here's another function which takes, you know, individual XIs as an argument and, you know, whatever it is. And in practice afterwards, we can actually ignore this thing. These will be just some functions, GI of XI. And the goal will be to do things as follows. For instance, I could ask, you know, what's the probability of XI given the rest? Now, that, of course, is the sum over everything but xi of this beast here. Remember, that's what we had before. This thing here. And I'm summing over everything but the i variable. Let's say this one here. And now what I get is basically you know, the term g of xi. That's the one that doesn't, didn't really affect the base here. And then I just have to do again my message passing. So I'm now getting incoming messages from J to I for you know, various of those ages. That's it. So I think now is probably actually a good time to take a short break, unless you have some questions. Any questions right now? So my JK lies in T 